welcome to the Drum and Bass Workshop. Here at uh, the Christian Musician Summit, we take everything very seriously. We want you to really dig into this workshop and get, glean a lot of knowledge as far as drums and bass goes. We want you to take it very seriously. I want you to focus specifically on left and right hand technique on the bass guitar, and uh, Ben will tell you what you need to focus in on with regards to the drums. I know with drumming, there's a lot to pay attention to. Two hands, two feet, but I have faith in you. You can do it. Just watch the hands and feet. Just watch the hands and feet. During this time, we're going to try and cover and then we'll go on to creating a musical lounge. Okay. And finally, we'll do
All right, so that's the first time we've played that together. <laughs> that was fun. Um, how many bass players do we have here? Woo! That's almost all of you. I think we've got three drummers. <laughs> how many drummers do we have? Good. And how many of you guys are together with your drummers and bass players? That's good news. That's good news. Cool. So it's like a singles class for dating. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Get to meet the other partner here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's just like we should start like a, like a Facebook club for lonely drummers and lonely bass players and get you guys together. No, um, so um, this workshop is called Building a Firm Foundation with Drums and Bass. And first thing I'd like to talk about is the landscapes of, that you can create with music um, and how you can create landscapes but still retain the, the actual um, the, the foundation that you don't want to lose that will drift away from what the song's supposed to be like. One of the common mistakes that I find walking into a lot of churches and, and visiting churches is, uh, with the band is that the, the guys are uh, very scared to, to shape their, the landscapes the, the, of the song. Uh, and what often happens is um, I walk in, and, and if it's an up-tempo song, the guys will kick off one, two, three, four, and they'll start on 10. And then they'll go on 10 the whole way through, and then that'll be it. And then if it's a slow song, then everyone starts on one and just stays on one for the whole time. That's using dynamics as far as the, own, the volume of the instrument as well as the dynamics that are available to them as far as arrangements go. Um, and the first thing um, <coughs> I'll be talking about is, um, is the, the, uh, the arrangement using dynamics. The one song we played was a song called Beautiful One by Tim Hughes, and we just got off the road with Tim. And uh, we're going to play that song real quick, and I'll show you. We're going to exaggerate the dynamic range of what we do on that song. So the, f the first part of the song, there's a little guitar intro. If you can play that first slide up there. Is there someone back there? Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> or whoever you are, mysterious being. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the first part is, uh, is like a little guitar intro on two. Then the intro kicks in real big. Uh, and then the verse drops down. The, the first chorus is big, but not as big as the intro. Second verse is a little bit more complex than the first verse, builds it up a little bit. And then the, the chorus, the second chorus is massive. And then the dr bridge drops right down and slowly ramps back up to about the size of that second chorus with another chorus. And the outro is real big, is bigger than the intro. Uh, we're going to play that, and we're going to emphasize the dynamic by being overly, emph overly emphasizing it. So uh, Ben's going to just play that for you real quick. So I don't know if you noticed that, but we dropped real, down real soft for the verse, and that was more of a level thing than an arrangement thing. Um, and that was kind of like over-exaggerated, but um, when you're starting out with an up-tempo song, um, the insecurity most of the time thinking, I wonder if this is going to fall apart, or if, I wonder if this is going to rock as hard as we want it to rock, will cause you to start on 10, just thinking, this has got to rock, this is the beginning of the set, this is the praise song. You know, and, and if you start out with nowhere to go, and you're kind of committed to number 10 already, then it just kind of, there's nowhere really to ramp up to from there. And then also, the, there's um, sometimes if you don't know the guys you're playing with that well and you don't completely trust each other, you'll, f you'll feel if I drop out, what happens if the, if the drummer, what's going to happen to the drummer? And uh, you might feel like if I drop out on the bass, will he, will he be able to carry on and will it still work? Um, and I think you need to be able to, in, in rehearsals, try those out and see if they can work for you. Ben's going to talk a little bit about the other part. but we're also changing it with the parts that we play. So uh, the verse is very quiet dynamically. It's also very sparse as far as parts go. So we're going to play the verse 
and show you what we're doing. One, two, three, four. Okay, so all I'm doing, I'm playing the backbeat, of course, but all I'm, all I'm really focusing on is the downbeat of one of every measure. And Daniel's also following along with that with his bass line. Yeah, so what I'm doing to help emphasize that laid back feel is I'm just playing single notes. I'm playing wonderful, so wonderful, or your unfailing love. <laughs> ministry on the bass, that's a bit of ministry for you guys. <laughs> and, then, uh, so, and then Ben is going to talk a bit about the chorus or the pre -chorus. Okay, So the chorus is pretty loud. It's not over the top loud, but it's driving, it's rocking. So uh, we'll, it's eighth, eighth note bass driven. We'll, we'll play it real quick. One, two, three, four. Beautiful one I love. Okay, so it's, it's pretty straightforward rock beat. Um, you know, anyone can play it, but it's, it's got energy, it's got drive to it. Um, the next section I want to talk about is the intros, uh, the turnaround from verse to chorus and, and the outro, even the bridge a little bit. If you listen to the song, it's got the same rhythm. Uh, it's still the eighth note pattern, but um, I would, I'll describe it like this. The first time I played with Tim, I met him on stage as we were about to play in five minutes. And uh, <laughs> he ran through the set list for me real quick, and he said, okay, I'm beautiful one. On the intro, I want you to play it like Coldplay. And that's all he said to me. And I was like, okay, I know what that means. And basically what that means is, if you listen to Coldplay or even you too, Beautiful Day, it goes like this. Okay, so we'll play the intro real quick and show you what Tim's intro sounds like. One, two, three, four. So if I could tell you how many times I've been asked to play that beat, you'd be surprised. But uh, <laughs> I just want to—I want to play you a couple examples of other artists who've used this this idea uh, to great success. The first one is Al Gordon. He uh, leads worship with Tim Hughes in London at their church, and he's put out a record on his own. This is a song called Glorious. the same idea. Here's another one by Leland called Reaching. Okay. Here's another one by uh, Michael Gunger Band called Be Praised. Sorry, wrong song. Pretty popular, as you can tell. Um, this next this next example is a little bit different. I'll play it for you, and then uh, I'll let Daniel explain why. You could tell Ben wasn't playing that the Coldplay kind of drum beat, but you still got that feeling that it was that kind of groove. And uh, what we did was we used the guitar. Well, the guitars weren't in that because that was the track, but the guitars, the bass player, and the keyboard player are playing that same accented feel. And to even accent it more, the, the 
turnarounds, the actual bass parts are actually changing at those points. So it goes, it goes. So it's da 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 da, and the drums are going to be playing. What did you play, Ben? I was just playing like a straight up beat. So there's creative ways that you can use these kind of feelings without having to completely sell out and play the exact complete groove that you would have, that would people say, oh, that sounds like Coldplay. So if you want to, you can, you, you can change up a little bit. Um, and uh, we, we feel like um, when, we, when we have to arrange new songs with people and we're about to go into the studio, you've got to rethink things a little bit, make them sound cool. But the main thing that, um, that I'd like to say about that is that, um, you know, there's parts to the song that are really set out and they're kind of, like the beautiful one, there's three different parts within the uh, pre-chorus, I mean, sorry, the intro, the chorus, intro, verse, and chorus have got three completely different parts. But every time we play an intro or a, or a pre-chorus, I mean, an intro or an in-between part, they're always exactly the same. There's, when, there's not changes on those, and the verses are always the same, and the choruses are always the same. So it's almost like there's patterns that are used. Uh, and so we wouldn't play like the coldplay kind of vibe as a as a pre-chorus one time and then as a chorus the second time. Try and keep your parts the same. Then it helps the band to know where they're going and it helps the song to feel like it's got a firm foundation. Um, this other song that we played with a guy called Matt Maher. Anybody know who Matt Maher is? Yeah. Oh yeah, look there, you got a good man there. <laughs> and uh, Matt Maher's song called... Uh, what's it called? Great Things. Uh, great, th great Things. It's kind of got a little bit of a country feel to it. Um, it's not a completely country song. He's not a country artist by any means, but he wanted this song to have a little bit of a country edge to it. So it's kind of somewhere between a country feel and a little bit of a rock feel. Um, so he's managing to create that illusion that it's got that feeling, but he's not selling out on the whole, the whole genre completely. So we'll play that one for you, Hearts, on the record real quick. So um, if you can, f you can feel a little bit of a kind of country edge, am I right? Anybody get that? A little bit of a nod from you guys? <laughs> yeah, we've got, this is on TV, remember? This is being filmed. <laughs> Give us a nod. <laughs> Good news. <laughs> okay, now what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to emphasize that country feel a little bit more so it sounds way more country. And I think if Matt was here and I played this, he'd probably go, no, 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 don't, don't do that. But I'm going to do it anyway. And uh, it's, it's going to sound a little bit different because I'm going to play more um, staccato parts which will emphasize the country feeling. I'm going to throw in maybe a little country little riff, which will make it sound a little bit more, and Ben will play a little bit more happy. So we'll play that again. By playing instead of so instead of just letting the notes ring through, I'm stopping and starting them a little bit. I'm adding in the fifth notes. Boom, ba boom, da 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 da, ba boom, ba boom. So that's kind of more country feeling. Um, and so if, if you're wanting it to be that way and shift the arrangement a little bit more towards that kind of vibe, if that's what you're having, wanting to do in the service, um, that might work for you guys. But I, f I still find that the, the best way to arrange the songs so that people have an easy in, we're here to serve the congregation, right? With our bass and drums and with our arrangements. So what you want to do is you want them to have an easy in. You want them to be able to get into it real e as easy as possible. So usually the best way to do it is kind of like the version that they would know in their heads already, which is usually the version that they've heard on the CD or on the radio, for that matter. Uh, and that's what my advice would be. Unless you've got a service that's kind of a youth service and you want it to be up more, more fun and more arranged differently so that it's kind of, 
more current or, if, or something like that, then you might want to change it up a little bit. So a mistake that often happens in, in situations where you're all just thrown together in a worship team and you're not kind of playing with the same guys every week is that um, the bass player and the drummer are playing completely different patterns. So Ben's going to talk and show you a pattern that, that we will do wrong right now. Okay, this is a song that we play with Brenton Brown a lot. It's called Lord Rain and Me. I'm going to play it like it's the first time I've ever played it. I've never heard it before. Daniel, of course, he's, he's known Brenton since they were 12 or whatever. So he knows the song pretty good. Um, but I'm just coming in, and uh, I'm going to play it like I think I know it. One, two, three, four. Do it again, but emphasize the ones with a, with a symbol each okay. time. One, One, two, three, four. So especially in the last part of that song, I was doing anticipated um, chords, and Ben was playing on the one. So he'll tell you a bit more about that. Yeah, so obviously I don't know the, how the song goes. And it sounds a little off because the crashes are happening by themselves, and the rest of the band is playing the chord changes on the, on the ends of the beat. So if I was going to follow them, it would make it sound much better. We're, we'll try it that way. One, two, three, four. So Daniel has taken me aside and said, look, this is how the chords go. <laughs> He's taken me out back and learned me. Um, obviously, the, the flow of the song feels much better if the drummer is following the rest of the band with the chord changes. Good stuff. Is that good stuff? You getting something out of that? Cool. You don't always have to play the same thing, but something like that sticks out, you know? So you want, you want cohesiveness between the drums and the bass especially, um, but when the whole band is doing the chord changes, the drummer's just off. He's off over here. Um, you know, it kind of just doesn't feel right. Um, another song that, that we've played before uh, with Michael Gunger is a song called Say So. And I'm going to, again, act like I don't know the song. And we'll, we'll see how bad I can mess it up. on the downbeats again and again everybody else is following the anticipated chord changes so it still sounds a little off okay so can everybody read music anybody not read music here Rhythm rhythmic rhythmically okay eighth notes are pretty simple um, if you're counting it one and two and three and four and that's what it looks like an eighth note rhythmic music I guess I don't know how to write melodic but anyways where, where the push is happening is on the end of four in that first bar, which is just a pickup into the chorus. The second measure is straight eighth notes. And then the, the last measure on top there is where that push is happening through the chorus, and the chord change happens there on the end of four. So if I'm counting one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and... Everybody needs to, I mean, in the band needs to know where that push is happening. So it helps if you can count one and two and three and four and. <laughs> it seems simple, but I've seen people mess it up, so. So let's um, play the song then real quick. I'm gonna play they can count with us. You want to you do that? Okay. Yeah, you guys can count with us on, and see if you can count those parts. You can clap on, clap on the right note. One, two, three, four. One and two and three and four and 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 one and two and three and four. Okay. By then it's not in the course anymore, but you guys are on it, man. Look at that. I only saw one or two. One or two. 
glorious. <laughs> That was great, guys. So, um, you know, if there's a chord, cha chord change happening on a push, what, what we're saying is it feels right for the drummer to follow that as opposed to just hitting down beats. Now, on the scan again, if you could put it back up there. Okay, Hallelujah, the song we play with Brenton. Uh, Your love is amazing. This is 16th notes, subdivision. Um, and this doesn't really follow the chord, chord progression, but it's something that Daniel and I are doing together. This is how the drum part would look, and I'll count it for you. One e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a. Okay. So that's the kick drum, though. That's the kick drum pattern, right? We, okay. You want to? You want to play it yeah. together? Okay. So this is a verse. We'll slow it down, though. Okay. This is a verse, and Daniel and I are playing together the low end. One e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a. Okay, so that's just us really solidifying an idea to create the foundation for everybody else to kind of play over. Benjamin. But it helps, it helps if you can count subdivisions. We're talking eighth notes, we're talking even quarter notes, and uh, 16th notes. Cool. Does that make sense? Uh, we, we do a song called Amazing God, which is on Britain's new record, and uh, it's, it's, we kind of arranged it so that people that are playing it in church can keep it really simple and, and really up-tempo, and I mean really friendly sounding. So the arrangements are really all major, major chords, not, not many minor chords in there. But when we go and play it, like at Echtus Festival or a couple of the festivals and we want to be a bit more edgy, we've changed the chords actually. The sub we've substituted chords to make it sound a little bit more edgy and a little bit more rock and roll. So we're going to play the original version real quick that's on the CD uh, and then we're going to play our new version which, we re which we've uh, arranged for other events. Okay, so that's the original version. Um, it's it's kind of real simple and easy to play in church. This next version is the, the, the more arranged. We come in earlier, so we've we've actually we start in the verse. We, the, that last time we only came in on the on the pre-chorus, yeah, pre-chorus, uh, and then into the chorus. So if you imagine it being like a, a terrain, it would almost seem like it's a much more gradual terrain, building up to the chorus. We're, now we're gonna we're gonna start pretty much jump in a little bit earlier. So we're making it sound more rock and roll, more bigger right at the beginning. Uh, and we come in right, right at the beginning, and then we're going to let you hear the second, the second verse. We could put up the other scan. Uh, the second verse, in that original version, I drop out completely because we, we haven't ramped up that far. So for, in order for me to create a landscape, I'm actually dropping out completely on the bass for the second verse. That's a trick that I, I often use to, to be able to create a new opportunity to build up again. So on the second verse here, though, I'm going to play a real sparse pattern uh, that's not as not as rocking as the first verse, um, and then I'm going to to enable us, which is actually that middle verse. Can you see the second step? So it goes intro verse. That second verse is bigger than the the third verse, which is coming up after the first chorus. So we'll do that now, real quick.
So um, that's kind of different from the other one. It's a little bit more rock and roll, and the, the chord changes are to start off on a, a minor, yeah, da, 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 instead of da 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 da. So by using a minor chord there, it kind of sounds more emo-ish, more, more, un <laughs> more unhappy, more miserable, and more pleasing to young people going through, going through their, their tr tr tremulous years. Uh, cool. <laughs> Okay, so another another um, song that we, that we've discovered has got a, one of these landscapes that is a is a typical pattern. That's a formula that these guys use. Is the hill song, the hill song guys. We we're going to put up that next graph real quick. Uh, we've we've discovered and uncovered their genius secret. <laughs> um, they they kind of have this intro, which is usually created by either a guitar or a little drum loop, and then the whole band kicks in. For the second part of the intro, the verse drops down again, so they they've give the vo vocalist space to, to be able to say what they're saying, and then the first chorus, everything just drops out. And then on one of them, there's a little bit of bass guitar and, a, and an acoustic, and the other one, well, there you go. <laughs> Why don't you just play that instead of the kick drum? It sounds about the same. <laughs> just kidding. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. We love each other. That's part of the vibe. So, um, so we're going to play that song real quick, and you'll hear, the, you'll hear what the arrangements do for those two, Hillsong, Mighty to Save and Hosanna. Is this coming out the house? Now the next one. <clears throat> so that's the chorus of both those songs. It's just nothing except like a little bass line. And, and it's kind of cool because what they're doing is they're creating an opportunity then to build up from scratch again. So they've, they've created the foundation of the song so everyone knows where it's, what it kind of sounds like. And they've given you um, the melody of the verse, they've given you the melody of the chorus, and the bass and drums kind of drop out. On the first one, the bass note just stays on one, so, and it just drones away, and the chord changes happen underneath that. So the foundation's still there, there's still a bass note, but it's not doing all the changes. And sometimes it's kind of really cool to just stay on one when the rest of the band's changing, doing the changes, because it builds up a bit of tension. And that's kind of what music is all about. It's building up attention towards something that's going to happen, and then it happens in the chorus. So if you're thinking about this arrangement, like these Hillsong arrangements, and you find an old worship tune that you guys are wanting to do, uh, from the bass perspective and drums perspective, you might want to think, hey, let's try and do this with a kind of a Hosanna, a Hosanna or, or a Hillsong feel, and, uh, and build a little intro, go and let the vocalist start off the verse, and then drop away completely in the chorus and see how it works for you guys. I think it's pretty cool. All right. Okay, so next we're gonna we're gonna take a song that uh, Brent and Brown wrote called "All Who Are Thirsty." It's about a 15 year old song. Um, we've played it quite a bit with Brenton. Uh, it's on his new record, um, "Because of Your Love." We're gonna play it like the version on that. We've been playing it like that for about a year and a half or so, um, just to show you what it what it sounds like.
So that's kind of a very easy congregational version of the song. Um, and once again, if, depending on your situation, if you've got a Sunday morning service that's a little bit more conservative, um, you want to serve them by, by playing a version of it that would kind of fit with their, them genre-wise and stylistically. Uh, if you're wanting to play your, Saturday night, your, your, your Sunday night service and it's money for young people, you might want to change the arrangement a little bit uh, into this kind of arrangement that we've got now, which is a bit of a newer, modern turnaround of that. Sorry, Ben, I stole your thunder there. Okay, so this version we're going to play next is just the guitar loop, okay, um, with a click. You'll probably hear the click as well, but that's all right. Um, we'll play a, play a verse section and then a chorus. sound like much without the rest of the band sorry about that <laughs> but um the bass and the drums we should be doing like da 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 and then there's a break da 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 and that's kind of a more fresh arrangement of the song same song and then when we get into the chorus uh, we're doing like a little build-up thing uh, so do that again chorus chorus one, one two three four It might not sound like much, but you guys are all blast players and drummers, so you kind of get a, an idea of what that does. Um, and then with the, you're leaving a lot of space then, so when we stop, you'll hear all the keyboards and the guitars and the textures and the sounds that the other guys are doing much more clearly, especially in a smaller room, uh, which makes it real fun and more interesting, I guess. Um, then, um, you want to go on to Phil's? Is there any questions so far? Anybody got any questions? Not yet. You don't want to be on TV. <laughs> okay, uh, the next section is, is a section on fills, and what, what um, we often experience is if you're going into a situation, once again, it's unrehearsed. Everyone jumps in and feels like, man, if I don't play, if I don't play a lot, this thing's just going to fall apart. So you tend to play a lot of fills, a lot of, and it's kind of overplaying. Um, and uh, we're going to show you a quick example of um, where Ben and I will play over each other, a fill over each other. Okay. So we, we both chose that exact same spot at the end of those bars to just play a, a fill. And if you're listening in the house, all you hear is yeah, and then it goes into the next section. Uh, and uh, this is kind of all, all coming down to arrangements again and, and spending the time to actually work out where those places are. Naturally, songs have got places where they just want something to be said. And if you've got a big band full of guys, keyboard player, drummer, bass player, and electric guitar player, you all jump on those same spots, it can sound real messy. Uh, and so in the arranging of your songs beforehand, you know, you could even have a, a thing worked out so that the drummer knows that at the end of the chorus, most of the time, he's going to get to play something, and I'll hang back. And somewhere in the middle of the chorus, maybe there's just a place there that feels like you could do a fill. He'll just keep playing straight beat, and I'll do my little fill, and you'll be able to hear the clarity of it, hopefully.
So what happened was in the middle of those bars, I did a little fill, and it would be coming through clearly because there's it's not he's not playing toms or anything over that. And then at the end of the chorus, I just I just kept playing my groove, and he he did a fill, and it, and you'd be able to hear the clarity of those toms, and you'd be able to hear everything real nice. Um, and then we're going to do an eight bar thing together where we'll actually play the same kind of rhythmic fill with each other, which emphasizes his fill and emphasizes my fill. So. So what uh, what I played was in the first part was da 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 da, and he went. What did you play, Ben? Uh, play again. One, two, three, four. So he went da 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 da, and I went. Oh. So it's it's the same rhythmic thing, although I've got notes that change, and he he doesn't really have melody, but he's he's playing the same phrasing as I did, and then right at the end. This is what I played and you played. And I went. That's my little little riff that I played at the end there and, and kind of fits together. One, two, three. Uh, does it make sense? Is it good stuff? <laughs> okay, cool. So for me, when I'm when I'm playing with a new bass player, even with Daniel, we play together so much. I'll start hearing him. He'll, he'll do the same fills in certain sections of a song. And sometimes I'll just choose to accent it. So I'm not doing some over-the-top fill. It's very simple usually, but it's enhancing what he's doing instead of running over it. Um, and, then, and then from the drum perspective, you know, you'll hear drummers playing, and every four bars, without fail, they'll do a fill. Every four bars. And that just gets a little monotonous to me. I try to either use a fill to set up a next section, like going from a verse to a chorus or a breakdown or something. Unless it's a song like if we're playing with Michael Gunger, it's very arranged, it's very rocking, and he wants people to play a lot. So that's really the only time I'm really playing a lot of fills is if it's more of an artist thing than a worship thing. Yeah, and those, those fills that you might see and think you think they're all completely spontaneous, with Michael's stuff, it's very arranged. We know exactly where we're supposed to play what. And it seems like it might have been a, a real uh, improvisational thing, but the parts are always the same and the fills are always kind of in the same place. And that creates a really good foundation for the rest of the, the band to, to say what they're going to say and for the people to get a, a feeling of the song. Basically, when you start a new song in a, in a congregation or at a gig or at an event, you have, to, you have to basically say, this is what kind of song this is. This is what, what the feel is, it. this is the tempo of the song, this is the kind of genre of the song, and this is dynamically what it's supposed to sound like. And you've got to build that feeling across the whole song. So in the, initially you want, to, you want to say as little as you can statement-wise and just let the song first have its foundation. And then when you want to say something like a, a fill or something, kind of keep it for later on in the song if you want, rather than you do it all at the beginning and then you've got nowhere to run to as far as the fills go. Cool. Ben? You know, whether, whether you're playing with a, 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 a specific bass player or a drummer all the time, or you're playing with someone new, you know, it's important to communicate. Like, if I hear Daniel do something that I really like and I want to, you know, f do a fill with it, I'll, t I'll say, hey, make sure you do that. You know, mark it on the chart or whatever. Um, but s since we play together so much, we make it a point to rehearse together and practice together. He comes over to my house, we set up you know, a way to listen to, listen to tunes and we'll, we'll run stuff and figure it out and, and listen to each other real well. So I would say even if, if you're just a musician in church and you're not getting to play all the time or you're not getting to play with a specific person all the time, you know, it doesn't hurt to get together and jam, kind of feel each other out and learn what each other, you know, their tendencies are and, you know, get to know each other better. Yeah, so basically, from, from this, this workshop and this time, we want you to take away the fact that, um, first of all, to create landscapes in music, to create that feeling that the song's going somewhere um, and it looks like it doesn't look monotonous and straight, you know, as far as the landscape looks like. Yeah, you want to be able to, um, number one, 
drop out and be able to be confident that the band's still going to be carry on, be able to carry on without you. And number two, you have to also be confident in your in your own playing that you're going to be able to say, I don't have to play here for people for it to feel right, or I don't have to always be playing. I'm going to listen to the song and I'm going to play for the song. Um, I'd love to have a few questions if there's anybody that's got anything. Anyone? Any bass players, drummers? If there's guitarists here, man, it'll be like, yeah, man, what about that? Why do you have such a funny tone? <laughs> Is there no, no questions about tones or anything like that that you guys would like to ask? Yeah. Okay. Very cool. The question was, um, their church has three different bands that rotate, so they're not always playing with the same guys. Uh, what would we suggest as a, as a rhythm section? Um, <clears throat> the first thing I would obviously say is, um, you know, the, is the, the more preparation that the worship leader does for the band beforehand in letting them know what they're going to be playing, the, the better it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be for everybody. Uh, the worst kind of church praise and worship practices that I've had is where you get given a chart and you just have to jump in and everyone's got to play. And then I tend to overplay, and I tend to not really it's jump all over everybody and stand on the drummer's fills, and it, it becomes a mess. So if you know what songs up in advance you guys are going to be playing, and then also to know, you know, that it sounds crazy, but simple is always going to be, it's always going to be better. But the bigger your band gets, the more simple you need to play. There's like there's a church parking lot, and there's only so many spaces that you can fill without uh, having a car pile up. <laughs> So if, you, if there's just a couple of you guys, there's just a bass player and an, an acoustic guitar player, the bass player can do a bunch of stuff that's rhythmical. And even like a home group situation where you're playing acoustic guitar, you know, you, you, you pr you're know, creating the rhythm. So you, you're actually playing the drums and the bass and the guitar all on one instrument, the same as a piano player. You know, If you're leading a home group by yourself, you're wailing away on the bottom end and you're playing all the chords that the bass player would be playing. And at the top here, you're playing all the rhythm that a drummer would be playing. So for, for those instruments to come into, into a situation where it's a full band, there's only so many parking spaces you're going to have to move out of some of those parking spaces and let other guys park there. So the bass player and the drummer, your bass player would want to live down where, the, where, the, where, it's, where you should. And some guys like an electric guitar player will say, hey man, I'm a bassist too. I'm an electric guitar, but I'm actually a bassist as well. And some electric guitar players will be all over the top of the neck playing <laughs> crazy stuff and forgetting about the foundational bottom end which is really, really the most important part about bass guitar, I feel. It's just to create that firm, solid foundation. Um, with 363, there was three guys. There was guitar, bass, and drums. And, uh, and for, so for me, I was kind of forced just to play right down here on the bottom end and hold it down. And then people would always con say, man, you guys sound unreal for a three-piece band. How does that happen? And that happens because I stick to the bottom. I stick to right down here and, and make, creating a firm foundation so that whatever John does on the electric guitar just sounds amazing. So, does that help answer that question a little bit? Anyone else? This is New York. <laughs> <laughs> New York State, come on, guys. All right. Is that it? I think, I think we're getting it. Okay. So, thumbs up. Thank you, Matt. We appreciate you guys. Thanks so much for listening.